at the end of this presentation, you'll have a, a better understanding or appreciation for all the various things that you can do with the print media, uh, rather than just simple black and white uh, prints. And I'm going to focus on, on three processes, uh, relief printmaking, intaglio printmaking, and lithographic printmaking. Uh, because of time consideration, I'm not going to be able to hit every, every process and every technique, but I'll try to get fill in as much as I can. Um, uh, I'll also discuss a little bit, a little history, and uh, of course I'll, I'll explain some of the basic techniques for those of you who have uh, not taken printmaking yourselves. The uh, photograph here is a photograph of the printmaking studio at Mark Arts. As you can tell, it, it's recent because people have masks on. So let's start with relief printmaking. And since this is a WAM uh, program, I thought it'd be appropriate to start off with some images that you've probably seen at the WAM. These are the works of some famous prairie printmakers. The one on the left is Burgess and Zane, and the two on the right is uh, Herschel Logan. And uh, the WAM has uh, a good collection of all the prairie printmakers, so again, I thought it'd be appropriate to come up and, and show these to you. I especially like the fact that this allows you to see the wide range of, of styles that you can get. I mean, they both were using the same process, probably using the same cutting tools, but you can see how differently they approached uh, their imagery. Um, relief printmaking uh, is the oldest printmaking form. It first, uh, the first relief print uh, that we know of was in uh, 100, 105 AD in China. And by no coincidence, this is the same time that the Chinese uh, invented paper. Uh, relief artwork had been around for centuries, but until somebody came up with, a, with paper or a form where you could, you could print off relief uh, blocks or, or sculptures, uh, there's no relief printmaking. So once the Chinese invented paper, then relief printmaking came along very quickly afterwards. And as, in, as, as paper making spread out from China throughout Southeast Asia, Manchuria, Korea, Japan, and then west uh, by the uh, spice trade to India and Islamic Middle East, relief printmaking came along with it very quickly. Um, <clears throat> tradition, so anyway, uh, relief print is where you take any material that is relatively flat, relatively smooth, but it's soft enough where you can either carve into it or gouge into it or scratch into it or etch into it. So you remove, you know, this, you remove some of the surface of the, of the material and then you print by rolling or painting in some cases ink onto the surface of the block or the plate. And so you're printing off the surface. That's why it's called a relief print. And in this photograph here, I've got a little uh, ink slab to the right and I just roll the ink up onto a, an ink brayer and then I roll the ink onto the, onto the surface of the, uh, in this case, it's a linoleum uh, plate. And so that's the basic technique for relief. It's pretty, pretty simple. If, uh, if you've had any relief print or any printmaking experience, in all likelihood, it was probably a relief print. It's the simplest, easiest, and, and cheapest form of printmaking. So if you had it in school, uh, any printmaking in school, in all likelihood, it was a relief print. My first relief print was when I was in the fourth grade. The art instructor came in and brought in some potatoes and cut the potatoes in half. And she gave us these dull white plastic knives and we carved out designs out of the potato. And she had us paint with a brush colors on the potato and then we stamped the potato down on a piece of paper. So it was basically a stamp technique. But that was my first uh, experience with printmaking. Now I'd like to show you a few more black and whites of, of artists, printmakers that I've known uh, since I've been in Wichita. And some of these people you may know or may not. The one on the left is by a well-known local artist, Jack Wilson. He did this back when we were graduate students at Wichita State. The one on the right was done by another graduate student, Adam Larson, and I'd like to show this again to see, see the differences in how you can approach the print. Uh, both of these artists had very different styles, they used different carving techniques, and so you can see how, how, how very different these things are. I mean, each artist brings their own style to their prints. Here's another one by a former graduate student, Lee Leighton Wallace. Again, you can see very different technique, very different style, very different look. 
And this is one that I did for a, uh, some years back for a portfolio project at Hutchinson Community College. They got together about 12 artists and 12 poets and each artist was given a poet, a poem, and we were asked to come up with an image that we felt would uh, relate to the, uh, to the poem. And so this, this was a really nice uh, project to bring writers and, and visual artists together. Now these, all these prints that I've shown now are, are simple, black and white, one color, black and white. Now I'd like to show you uh, some color techniques, um, which is going to start complicating things a little bit. This is one of mine. Of course, on the top is the it's a linoleum plate block or plate, and I the top is where I just printed in black, and then of course, obviously b below I I added color to it, and uh, this is a technique that I learned as a graduate student at Wichita State. And in this photograph, you can see the, the top, although it's kind of in shadow, that's the linoleum plate there. Then you have my, I have my black version, my colored version. And you'll notice underneath the color version, I have these cutouts. And what you do with this process is you, you, you cut out your block, you print it in black or whatever color, and then you take the print while the ink is still wet and you transfer it onto a piece of matte board or cardboard. And then you cut the matte border carpet out like a jigsaw with a with a uh, exacto knife. In this case, I had about 12 different pieces cut out, and after I cut them out, I sealed each one with a layer with a I painted polyurethane to seal the matte board, and then I just inked up each one individually with a brayer and transparent uh, printing ink, and then I just took my little pieces of jigsaws and I just placed them carefully onto the black and white print, ran it through the press, and the ink transferred from the matte board to the print. The, uh, I believe, I may be mistaken, that, that this process was taught at Wichita State by the current graduate student there, Randy Cust, who I believe learned it uh, as an undergraduate student in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. I think that's correct. But this is a really easy and efficient way of doing a multicolor print um, and I use it all the time and you're going to see this process over and over again because I absolutely love this process. Here's another example. Again you can see the black and white on the left, the color version on the right, and below you can see all my little cutouts. Um, so very simple, very easy. Now traditionally Uh, when people started doing multi-colored prints, uh, they would do multi-blocks. Now I might mention um, almost all colored prints up until the mid-1800s in Europe and America, almost all of them were hand-colored or hand-tinted. You would print your plate or your block in black or whatever dark color, and then you come back in and paint with watercolors or whatever you had available. Printmaking, multicolor prints using print processes didn't come along until European and American printmakers discovered Japanese multicolor woodcuts. And this was around 1870 to 1890. And this opened up a whole new world of printmaking processes and techniques. Uh, the Japanese printmakers, and this is during the Edo period, 1600s, 1800s, they would print their images by taking their image and transferring it to three or four blocks, and they would then cut one block for their yellow color, or one block for their red color, one block for their blue color, and maybe one block for their black color or their key block, and then they would, of course, they'd have to have a registration system to make sure that everything printed properly, they everything locked in, and so they'd print each block separately. They'd print the yellow first, then the red on top of the yellow, and so on, et cetera. Well, this is a great way of doing a multicolor print, but of course, it's a very time consuming. You're, you're cutting four blocks, and you're printing four blocks, and then you have to make sure they're all registered, so this is a very time consuming, labor intensive process. The one I'm going to show you here is one I did recently, but I just used two blocks or two linoleum plates. This one, you can see the linoleum on the left and the black proof that I printed on from it. 
And then this was my color plate. Again, you can see it on the left, see the color version on the right. Now what I did here, I could have done four, cut four blocks, and if I was 25 years old, I probably would have done that, but I'm getting lazy in my old age. And so what I did, I decided to do all the colors on the, on the second linoleum plate. And what I did was I took my colors, my yellows, my reds, my browns, my blues, and I spread them out on an ink slab, and then took a large roller and I blended the colors from the slab onto the roller so that the yellow would go into the red, creating orange, and the red into the brown, and so on. And then I rolled it onto the linoleum, and this is what's called a rainbow roll or a split roll. This is a way of doing a multicolor, complicated multicolor print without going through the process of cutting all kinds of blocks. It's very similar to this, to the mat board technique I showed you earlier, where you know it's just so much easier to get multicolors using these techniques than multi blocks. But this was the final version. So here I printed the color plate first, waited for the ink to dry, then printed the black you know, key plate on top of it. The key, of course, is registration. Registration, I mean, it's so easy uh, for registration to get all, and there, there are very various ways of coming up with, with registration, but, but it's, it's critical because you don't want to have all that time and effort you know, wasted by having the, uh, the plates or blocks not print properly. Now, all the ones that I've shown you right now, all the ones, previous prints I've shown you right now up to this point have been linoleum prints, relief prints. And there's a reason for that. This is a wood block print by a former student of mine. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because you can see the grain of the wood in this image. And it's really the grain of the wood that makes this piece. It, it adds the dimension that you cannot get with a linoleum. And my feeling is uh, for centuries, the most relief prints were done using wood because it was readily available, relatively cheap, and it wasn't all that difficult to carve, especially if you're using softer woods. But in the 20th century, they came up with all kinds of new ways of, of printing relief prints, including linoleum. And um, they also had came up with, uh, recently, they got what's called resin gray block, soft cut, speedy carve. There are all kinds of new materials of different densities and hardnesses that you can use. But the nice thing about linoleum, it, again, it's, it's easily available, it's relatively cheap, and it cuts easier and cleaner than wood. You don't have to deal with wood grain. Your carving tools don't dull as fast. It's just faster and easier. So contemporary relief printmakers, as a rule, have gone to linoleum. And my feeling is really the only reason to do a wood block anymore is if you want the grain of the wood to be part of your image. And in this case, that's, that's exactly what it's doing. Um, and so when my students ask me, come in, well, I want to do a relief print. Do I, should I do linoleum or, or wood? I say, well, if the brain of the wood's not important, just do linoleum. It'll save you a lot of time and effort, and it won't be nearly as frustrating. This is one I did uh, a year ago. This is a wood 24 by 24 wood block. Uh, last year, Wichita State was kind enough to ask me to participate in their steamroller event. And at this event, they had about 12 printmakers, and we were required to use wood rather than linoleum because they printed it by rolling over the, the blocks with a steamroller in the parking lot. And linoleum wasn't going to withstand the pressure. So I thought, okay, if I'm going to do a, a wood block, I want the grain to be part of my image. So I got this 24 by 24 piece of a very soft, cheap wood. And what I did was, it already had a subtle grain to it. I didn't have to do a whole lot with that. But after I had carved and chiseled out the images, the, the fossils um, that you see here, I did two things. I took a, uh, a drill and a wire brush, and I accentuated the grain of the wood by wire brushing areas inside this, this, this square area where the fossils are. Now on the outside, the frame area, 
I didn't want that much grain, so I coated the outside frame with three coats of polyurethane to knock the grain down a little bit. So I wanted the outside frame to be a little more, more of a flat black area and then have all that grain on the inside, which is where the main focus should be. This is the final version um, where I added color to it. Now this is another process of adding color that, is, that has become very popular, and this is a monoprint technique. After I had printed the wood block, I printed my edition five, six, seven, however many I wanted to print, I then took a piece of plexiglass, about the same size as the block, and I added transparent inks onto the plexiglass using a roller or brayer or brushes or whatever I had available. And then I created what I hoped would be a geological textures and forms by squeegeeing the ink with cardboard, uh, pieces of cardboard or with brushes. And then I took some, uh, a toothbrush and some mineral spirits and I did a little splattering techniques. Basically I wanted to activate uh, and have a real textured, uh, uh, multicolored textured uh, field. And then I took the plexiglass and I laid it down onto the print and ran it through the press and the ink transferred from the plexiglass to the print. This is a, this is a very loose, very spontaneous way of creating really interesting colors and textures. And again, it's very simple. Uh, all you need is just a piece of plexiglass and, and some brushes and some, and some rollers and brayers and, and it, you, you're ready to go. These are two examples of a former student of mine, Caitlin Penny. Now, she had a whole different approach. Now, these were woodcuts, but the reason they are woodcuts because she didn't carve her, her uh, relief prints using carving tools. She used a Dremel tool. And, of course, the Dremel tool created a lot of friction, and when she tried to use it on linoleum, the linoleum would just melt. So she had to use wood, whether she liked, wanted to or not. And so all these images were carved out with the Dremel. Now another thing she did differently was that she used both the front and back side of the, of the wood block. One, one side would be the key block, the, dark, the, the black uh, key image, and then the, on the back side of the same block she would do her colors. Now I've never had anybody do this before and the reason, because this is, this is a little dangerous because when you cut a block on one side and leave the back side uncut, when you run, run the, the block or plate through the press, you're going to get even pressure. But if you're cutting on both sides of the block, you're going to have uneven pressure because the areas that have been cut on the back side when you run it through the press are not going to have as much pressure as the areas that do have uh, on the, the back surface that does have something not cut. I guess I'm going to try and say. So when she would do this, there'd be areas that, would, that could potentially come out light. Uh, now, she, she got away with this. She, she'd been doing it for a long time. She's gotten away with it, but it's not a process that I recommend because you just don't, you have a, there's a consistency problem here. Anyway, uh, so on, the, on her colors, what she would do is she would ink the back side of the, of the block with, with several colors using several different rollers or, or brayers. And like she'd have a braid with yellow, it had braid with red, or a braid with green, or whatever she, colors she was using. And she would blend the colors on the, the wood as she's rolling it up. So she'd roll areas up with the yellow, and then she rolls it with the red, and she'd let the red and the, and, the, and the yellow blend to create orange and so on. And then of course she'd then print it, and then after the ink was dry, she'd come back and print the, back, the other side of the, of the block in black, and then hopefully everything would register you know, properly. The third thing that Caitlin did was after she'd done that, she would then go in and hand paint and hand tint using watercolors or acrylics or whatever she had available. Uh, the skies above the mountain on the left and the skies above the hills on the, uh, on the right were all hand painted. Now this is one that I did, and this is a, this is a, a relatively new way of, of uh, producing a relief print. This is called a solar plate. A solar plate is it's a commercially manufactured plate. It's, it's basically a thin piece of aluminum uh, or aluminum or stainless steel that has a, 
a, a light sensitive emulsion on one side. Now this light uh, sensitive emulsion is water soluble and what you do is in this case I took a piece of transparent film and I did a a pen and ink drawing on the film with Indian ink. And after I'd done that, I then placed the film, the, draw, the Indian ink drawing and the film onto the solar plate and I exposed it to ultraviolet light for five minutes. What the ultraviolet light does is that those areas of the solar plate that are exposed to the light harden are, and are no longer water soluble. So after five minutes of exposure, I removed the film I put the plate in warm water and I gently massage the plate with my hand or a brush and the emulsion that has not been exposed will dissolve away leaving your, your, your image. So there's no carving, no gouging, no nothing. Basically I just did a pen and ink drawing. After I had washed it away I, I uh, cleaned the plate, exposed it for five more minutes in ultraviolet light to to permanently set the plate, at which point I could take it out, put it on, put it on the table, ink it up, and start printing. Mm -hmm. So it took me 15 minutes to process the plate. It might have taken me maybe a half hour to do the drawing. So I was knocking out a relief print in just you know maybe an hour and a half, two hours. If I was going to do that with a linoleum or a woodcut, it would have taken me several days to do this. So this is a fantastic way of doing a relief print without having to do all that carving. So, so you may notice by now I'm coming up with all these simpler ways of doing prints <laughs> than, than the traditional methods, which is a very human thing. We're always looking for ways of cutting, being more efficient and cutting our time down and so on, et cetera. Now this particular piece I, I printed in black and all the colors I painted with, with watercolors. Now something I, I want to mention as, a, as an aside is that uh, because of the Japanese influence, because of, of developing all these new color techniques for, for making prints, hand coloring and hand tinting went out of fashion by about the 1940s. After that, almost, almost all of the prints you're gonna, color prints you're going to find were done using printmaking techniques. And in fact, when I came along as an undergraduate student in printmaking in the late 70s and then a graduate student in the early 80s, uh, hand coloring a print was a major no-no. <laughs> if you want to be taken seriously as a printmaker and you're going to do color prints, you were expected to use printmaking techniques only. Now this has changed dramatically and today hand painting and hand printing prints is just commonplace. Everybody does it. But when I was there, that was not acceptable. And it took me years to accept having people hand color and hand tint their prints. I mean, to me, that was just not the way it was supposed to be done. But I've mellowed with age. And I had plenty of students who wanted to hand color and hand tint. And it's like, hey, it's your art. You do what you want to do. You just go for it. Now, this last process I'm going to show is called a reduction block print. Now, the concept is really very simple. You're going to do a multi, multi color print using only one block or one plate. And what you do here is, you, in this case, a linoleum plate. You draw your image on the plate. You cut out those areas that are going to be white or going to be the color of the paper. If you're, obviously, you're printing on colored paper, like beige or whatever. That's what the color is going to be. But you cut out your white. And usually, traditionally, you, you, you print from light to dark. You'll then ink up the plate with your lightest color, let's say a very light yellow. And then so you'll print the, the yellow. Now, you can't go back in this process and, and print a, a second time. So if you're going to do an addition of 10 or 15 or 20, you have to print, you have to print it all at one time. So, so you ink it up yellow. You're going to have to print all 15 at the same time because once you're done, you're going to take you're going to wash that yellow ink off and you're going to carve back into the plate those areas that you want to keep yellow. You then, after you've done that, you roll up your second color, let's say a lime green. You then print your lime green on top of the yellow prints that you printed previously. You then clean your plate, carve out the areas that you want to keep 
green, and then you roll it up with your next color, orangish brown or whatever, and you print that. And so this is the process. You, you print it, you carve some areas out, you print it, you carve areas out. And so the surface of the, of, of the plate is getting reduced. Well, that's why it's called a reduction print. So by the time you're, you reach your darkest color, maybe 75 or 85 percent of the original linoleum or wood block has been cut away. Very simple uh, concept, but it's probably the most difficult and most challenging way to do a multicolor relief print. Consequently, for the first 12 years that I taught at Mark Arts, or the, what was the Wichita Center for the Arts, I never had a student do a reduction block print until Marsha Skirfield showed up. And these are a couple examples of hers. And when she uh, told me that she was going to do that, I was very surprised. Uh, I, but at the same time, I was, I, I was supportive. But privately, I had some serious doubts. Uh, well, I turned out I was seriously, seriously wrong by doubting Marsha. The one on the left is the first one she did. She wisely is a relatively small reduction block print, very simple, just a few colors. But once she did that, she just took off on me. And the second one is here on the right, a, a cormorant. And you can see how much, how many more colors and how more complex that this one is. And it's, it's a large. It does. You can't see it here, but it's a much larger. Uh, print, and then here are two more. And look at the complexity of the one on the right. So Marcia is getting, her prints are getting larger and more complex, and uh, these are absolutely first-rate reduction block prints. I mean, these, these, are, these are gallery and museum quality reduction block prints. And to my further amazement, uh, I now have I've now had in the last few years four or five other students doing reduction block prints, which I never would have believed was going to ever happen. So thank you, Marcia Skirfield. So let's go on to the next section, which is intaglio printmaking. Uh, I'm going to deal basically with line etching, aqua tints, dry point, and collagraph. And this photograph just has a photograph of, of a copper plate and some of the materials, a hard ground, uh, rosin, and uh, a few other items that I'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, Tala printmaking is very similar to relief printmaking that you are removing surface material either by carving or gouging or, or using acids or whatever, but instead of printing the surface of the plate, you're printing below the surface of the plate. And here's an example of a copper plate etching that I'm inking up. On the left, I'm inking it up. I'm using uh, some uh, pieces of a mat board that I cut out in little squares and the key is to force the ink down into the etched or engraved or gouged out lines on the, on the plate. Once I've done that, you then want to remove the ink from the surface of the plate, which is the opposite of a relief print, and you can see that on the right, I'm taking what's a material that's called tarlatan. It's a very stiff uh, sort of cheesecloth material and I'm wiping the plate, I'm, I'm removing the, the, the ink off the surface. And on the left, I've, I've done that. Uh, you can see the copper. You can, it's, it's difficult, but you can see that. You can see the copper on the surface of the plate on the left. And once I've got it properly wiped, you then put it on the press. And you want to print intaglio prints with, with slightly damp paper because you're forcing the, the paper down into the plate, you want that paper to be soft and malleable. And you can do that by dampening it ahead of time. You don't damp uh, paper when you're doing relief prints. And then on the right, you can see that I've, I've, I've run it through the press and I'm now pulling it off the copper plate. Uh, here, here's an example of the copper plate, etched copper plate on the right, and then there's the, the print on the left. And I'm going to talk here a little bit about some of the processes of, of intaglio printmaking. Now here again, here are two, two examples of a prairie printmaker that everybody is uh, probably aware of, which is Charles Capps. The one on the left is a line etching, and the one on the right is a combination line etching and aquatint. Now as years went by, Capps obviously became, fell in love with uh, the aquatint process, because almost all of his later 
prints were primarily aquatints, and he was a true master of the aquatint. You have a chance to see his work here at the WAM or Mark Arts or whatever, I urge you to do so because these are as good aquatints you're going to find anywhere. And then here on the left is a line etching by Lloyd Foltz, another prairie printmaker. And then on the right I've got a little uh, line etching of, of my own. So let me go over some of the processes. Uh, most entirely prints today are either done on zinc or copper plates, metal plates. You can do aluminum uh, as well. And um, the easiest way to produce an entalopray is to, use, is to do what's called a dry point, where you just take a scribe or an etching needle or a nail, anything with a sharp point, and you just scratch directly into the copper, into the zinc. The, the, the more force you use when you scratch, the deeper the, the line you'll create, and the darker and, and wider the line will be. And then you print it up again after you've done scratching into the plate, you then ink it up forced inking into your, into your dry point lines, wipe the surface off, and print it. The other technique is a line etch, and with a line etch, which you see here, two versions here, what you do is you coat your, your plate, in this case copper, with what's called a hard ground, which is a solution as asphalt and beeswax and gum turpentine. You then heat the plate on a hot plate, which evaporates the gum turpentine, leaving a thin, hard, film of ground on your on your copper and then you take your needle or your scribe and you just very gently scratch through the ground exposing the copper plate. Once you've exposed the copper plate you then put the the copper plate or a zinc plate whatever you or you're using into a, a into a solution that will etch it. Traditionally uh, printmakers used to use a solution called Dutch mordant which was hydrochloric acid and potassium chlorate and water and you would set it in that solution and the longer it was in the solution the deeper the acid would cut into the copper so if you wanted a real light line you might put it in there for five minutes and take it out if you wanted a real dark line you might leave it in there for 20 or 30 minutes that's how you get your light and dark lines and etching but uh, Dutch Morton is, is, is toxic and so I don't think anybody uses it anymore. We, what we now use is ferric chloride, which is essentially a salt bath. It's non-toxic. You don't have to worry about fumes. You don't have to worry about getting it on your fingers. As long as you, don't, as long as you wash your fingers and don't suck your fingers, you're okay. It's a very safe process. It does take longer than Dutch Morton, but that's, a, that's an okay uh, uh, compromise. Um, now, on the one on the right, with my, my little uh, etching there, uh, the standard procedure is you put your hard ground on, you draw into the hard ground the areas that you're going to have light lines, you put it into the solution, you etch it for five, ten minutes, whatever, you take it out, you wash off the hard ground, you ink it, and proof it to see what you've got. If you like what you've got, great. You, there's no, you don't need to go back and rework anything. If you like it, then you add the, had, add the hard ground onto the plate again, you draw back into it, with, and you're going to etch these second batch lines longer than your first batch. So this time I might etch it for 10 or 15 minutes. Then I clean it off, ink it up, prove it, see, what I'm, see what's happening, make sure I know what's going on, because it's hard to tell just looking at the copper. And she just keep repeating this process over and over again until you go from light to dark. And uh, so it can be, you may have to etch the plate seven, eight, nine, ten times. Um, so it's a labor intensive process. Uh, one downside of uh, line etching, it's really difficult to get solid blacks. Because in order to get a solid black, you have, to, you have to etch lines on top of lines, on top of lines, on top of lines, and do this several times. You just build up a lot of lines using a cross hatching technique. And, and that's what I had to do on the, on the print on the right to get those darks. Now, a, a very famous artist that you all know about who was fantastic at this was Rembrandt. I don't know how many uh, line etchings he did, but he was prolific and he was a master. Uh, now, Rembrandt did include some dry point, but I would say probably at least 90% of, his, of his prints were line etchings. Um, 
This is another one I did. Now this is an aqua tint, my version of an aqua tint. Now an aqua tint is where you take your plate and you sprinkle or dust the, the plate with a very fine, thin uh, uh, film of powdered rosin. And once you've got that fine film of powdered rosin on the plate, you then heat it on a hot plate and you melt it onto to the plate. And what this does, this gives you large, nice, consistent, flat areas of, of values and tones. And this is what Caps was a master at. So what you would do, Caps, for example, he would take his plate, he would, he would do a very light line etch to get his composition on his plate. And then after he got the, you know, the basic composition on the plate, he would then uh, apply the raw powdered rosin onto the plate, melt it. He would then block out those areas that they had one in white with, with a stop all varnish or with a hard ground put it in the acid solution for five, 10 minutes, take it out, wash it off, block in the areas that are gonna be slightly gray, put it back in the acid, take it out, wash it, block out the areas that are gonna be medium gray, and so you just go light to dark. So, you just, so it's in a way, it's a reduction process. You just keep putting it back, every time you put it back in the acid, it's gonna get darker. And so you just go from light to black. This one that you have in front of you is, uh, is my version. Now, the bird, I used the traditional powdered rosin. And uh, one of the nice things about, about aqua tinting is that you can manipulate it. You can either, you can lighten up an aqua tint. If you put it, play it in, and it's, you put it in a little bit too long, oh, this is a little bit too dark, you can lighten it up by very carefully burnishing the aqua tint, and that'll lighten it up. So you can go from dark to light, but there's a limit. I mean, you, you know, you, there's a limit to how much you can burnish or you can also take, you can also scrape an aqua tin off the surface of the, of the copper plate um, and literally re remove all of it. So with this bird, I did both things. I did, I did the powdered rosin and then went back in and I created textures with, with, by scraping out areas to get whites and, burnish, and burnished areas to get grays, which is a you know, very traditional way of using aqua tints. Now the cloud formation on the back is also an aqua tint, but I didn't want to use powdered rosin. I wanted to use something that would give more texture. So this is a spray paint aqua tint. I just took a can of, of enamel spray paint and I, and I, I blocked out the, the bird and I sprayed the background and, and etched it just like with a, a regular uh, aqua tint. Here are two other examples of, of some of mine. The one on the left, one I did recently, again, uh, it's a combination line etch, it's a combination uh, aqua tint using uh, rosin and, and spray paint. And on the right, again, it's a combination. This is part of my Wichita series that I did some years ago. It, it includes line etching, it also includes dry point, it also includes uh, the two different versions of, of uh, aqua tinting. So I kind of combined all the different uh, processes together. Here I got two examples of the of the late uh, Wichita State professor of printmaking John Boyd, and I wanted to show these because to show you that you can also you know, incorporate textures into this process, and you can see the textures especially in the background of of his uh, kilowatt guy, and you can also see some textures behind his his dog shape there on the one on the top left. Now I think John used what was called a white ground where it was kind of a, a thick putty brown where you just, just literally just paint it on the surface of the, of the plate with a brush and when you etch it you'd have the brush strokes. Uh, pretty, pretty simple way of, of, of coming up with textures. The one on the bottom left is one of mine. Now I got the textures on this one by dissolving a uh, what's called a tush material, a stick tush, and I'll talk about tush in a little bit later but I dissolved this tush material in lacquer thinner and I just took a brush and I painted the, the wash on the copper plate and when the lacquer thinner evaporated, it created this very interesting texture. So they're, they're and again, they're, they're, I'm not, I can't get into everything, but those, those are two ways of, of getting texture on your plates. Now for color, again, you can, 
doing color in tile plates are basically the same processes of release as doing color relief. You can do multi plates, multi blocks. And the one on the left is, is an example of a line etching by Randy Cust when he was a graduate student. This is a three plate. Uh, he, had, uh, he took the image, he cut out three plates, cut them out the same size. One plate was for yellow, one plate was for red, one plate was for blue, and then he just printed them yellow and then red on top of yellow on top of, red on top of yellow and blue on top of of, of the red. And uh, now when you do this process, you can do it either wet or dry. You can you can print the yellow and wait a couple days and let it dry, and then print the red on top of the yellow, let it dry, or you could print it all at the same time. If you print the colors, the yellow, red, and red, yellow, red, and blue plates at the same time, you get more mixing because the ink is, is is wet. So it gives a different look. You get a very different look if you're printing wet or dry, and just depends on what you prefer. The one on the right is also a three plate etching, but this is mine, and I did this using aquatints. So you can see Randy based, most, Randy's was mostly line etching, mine was almost all aquatinting. Now, of course, you're not limited to three plates. You can do four plates, five plates, six plates. You can get as complicated as you want to get. But again, it's time consuming and it's expensive. So here we go with a way of, of doing this, less, an easier way of, of doing a multicolor Intelli print, and this is an example here. It's a copper plate at, you know, uh, I did aqua tinning in, you know, on the uh, geographical areas. The landscape up, up on top I, was, was all line etched. Now all the colors in the geographical and the geology areas, you know, all the different rock forms, I used the old cutout and then board technique. So I transferred this print onto the mat board, cut it out into my jigsaw pieces, inked them up individually, red, yellow, brown, blue, gray. And then I just printed this uh, print using that method. And then for the trees and the landscape atop, I resorted to watercolor. If I, were, if I was going to do this as a multi-plate, again, it would have taken me probably a couple months to do this. Now the last one I'm going to show in Italio is a couple by local well-known painter artist James Kant. Uh, Jim took my class for several years, and what he these are solar plates. Uh, but but instead of using a solar plate to create a relief print, he used a solar plate to create an Italio print. Now what Jim would do is he'd take a photograph of one of his paintings, download it on his computer. Uh, turn it into a black and white image or a grayscale image and then he would m manipulate on his computer, remove areas, enhance areas, he'd, whatever it was he wanted to do. And then he would use a laser printer to print the image from this computer onto transparent film. You then put the transparent film on the solar plate, expose it to the ultraviolet light, take it off, wash it and wash the plate in, in water and then you ink it up like you would a copper plate. And so, so now you've got an intaglio print that didn't involve uh, any solutions. I mean, you could do it all, you could you literally do everything on, on your computer. The wonderful thing about this is, is, is this technique allows printmakers to, to incorporate digital and photographic images into their prints. And I've done this myself where I would cut out a small plate and uh, transfer a, a digital or photographic image and then I'd print, take that and print it into one of my prints. Uh, now the one on the left, same thing, only this one he hand colored. He liked to hand color his prints. Uh, I think this one might have been, he might have used uh, oil pastels, I'm not sure, but he used oil pastels, watercolors, you know, I mean he's a phenomenal painter so he just painted uh, whatever he had available. But this was a way of, of Jim to, to turn his oil, these big oil paintings into hand-pulled prints. Um, now, the last thing I'm going to show you in this, I, I forgot about this one, I'm just going to show a couple images because I'm not going to get too far into it. This is called a collagraph print. Uh, collagraphs, uh, if you took a be beginning primate class, which I say under David Bernard, you're going to do a collagraph because this is one of his favorite techniques that he helped uh, market. Uh, Collagraphs are, are very recent. Uh, they really just came into being around the, in the, about the 1950s, and at first it wasn't taken seriously as a printmaking 
process, but now it's, it's widely accepted. Uh, basically, you create a, a collagraph by taking, you can take any kind of uh, material. In this case, I took a piece of matte board and I just glued on textures. So I'm collaging my image. The plate is on the left and base, it's hard to see, but I glued on sandpaper. I glued on different textured wallpapers. I put on Elmer's glue. I, I just cut out a bunch of materials and I glued them all together to create the composition. And you can see the, the, the print there on the right. Uh, the real dark areas are sandpaper. You can see some textured areas that, that were the wallpaper. So you just take any textured materials you can, you can find and just collage. Uh, now after you've glued everything on, you do have to seal the, the collagraph plate with polyurethane uh, but, you know, so that things aren't going to start pulling off when you start inking it. But you ink it like a copper plate. You print it like a copper plate. But you're just using very simple, cheap materials, matte board and you know, whatever, whatever found objects you can find. Uh, here's, a, here's another version that I did in color. So again, you know, you can use the same color techniques with a collage that you can do with any other printmaking process. I could have used my, you know, a wide range of different, of different ways of printing color, but this is kind of an interesting, fun way to create a print from scratch. Uh, so people who, who, are, who like to do collaging and like textures, this is, this is a very fun process. Okay, my last process is lithography, which is my favorite. 70% uh, of all the prints I've done in the last 40 years or so have been lithographs. And three of the most common ways of doing a lithograph is either using a quarried uh, limestone from Bavaria, Germany, which had the best limestones. Uh, they went out of business in the 1990s, so there's no more uh, lithographic stones being quarried, so uh, when they uh, disappear, they're gone for good, apparently. So this may, this may be a dying art form. You can also use aluminum plates and zinc plates that are ball-grained. And lastly, you got what, what I call a poly plate, and I'll mention that last. So on the left, you've got a stone on the graining rack with an old image. Before you do a stone lithograph, you have to remove the old image. And so you wet the stone and you apply a what's called a carbonurinum grit. It's a, it's a fine powder of silica dioxide. And then you take that lever gator back there and you put it on and you rotate that lever gator and you just grain the surface of the limestone clean. You want to remove that old image. Now this may take two, three, four times before I finally get that image removed. But once I get the image removed, I can then start drawing directly on the limestone, as you see on the right, with a crayon pencil, or lithographic crayon or pencil. And so I'm just literally drawing onto the surface of the stone. Lithography is both the easiest and most difficult process. It's the easiest because it's the most direct. You're not changing the surface of the limestone. You're not carving. You're not gouging. You're not doing anything to the surface. You're just drawing directly onto it. Drawing onto a limestone with a crayon pencil is no different than, than doing drawing on paper with a pencil or, or graphite. It's exactly the same thing. You don't have to learn anything new. The only difference is you cannot erase a lithographic crayon. You can't go back in and make changes. Once you draw it on the surface of the, of the stone, there it is. So you better like it. Um, and you can do the same thing with, with, with tush, where you can literally paint on the surface of the stone or the plate the same way you'd paint on paper or canvas. So it's very direct. Um, and here's the, on the left, I got, the, I got the stone. In fact, this is the stone of the image that, is, that I currently have in the uh, foot in your door. Uh, um, so I got it on the press and uh, ready for, for printing. Um, what makes lithography hard is the chemical processing of the image. Uh, to process the image, uh, you have to... Limestone is all, already uh, semi-porous, and once you've got the image on the stone, you then process it with gum arabic and nitric acid. Now, there, it's a very complicated chemical process. There are a lot of formulas. If you look in a lithographic book, I mean, it's very complicated. But basically what the gum arabic and nitric does is it bonds the image to the surface of the stone 
and it opens up the grain of the, of the, of the limestone so it, so it absorbs, it's more water loving than before you process it. Because the whole point of lithography is that you ink up the, the uh, image by rolling ink on the image and as long as the limestone is kept damp, the, the ink will only attach itself to the image. It won't attach itself to the surface of the limestone. So you, so as long as, and you can see there on the right, I'm, I'm, I'm working the surface there. Uh, so basically, it's, it's, a, it's a, a grease water process. Uh, grease doesn't like water, water doesn't like grease. So if you do the process properly, when you roll it up, and you have to use lithographic inks, you can't use other inks, when you roll it up, you know, only the, only the image will take ink. Um, however, if you don't do the process correctly, then it's not going to print at all. If, uh, and there are different formulas. If you look in a lithographic book, they'll say if you're going to do a crayon, you want one ounce of gum arabic and four drops of nitric acid, or uh, an ounce of gum arabic and eight drops of nitric acid. The problem is, if the formula is not right, if you don't have enough nitric acid, uh, then when you start rolling it up with the ink, the whole, ink, the whole image will, will eventually go black and you'll get a real scumming problem and you'll just, you just lose the image. Too much nitric acid and you'll burn the image and it won't take any ink at all. So you've got to find the right combination. The other thing is the ink you're using has to be just right. The viscosity has to be just right. Not too thick, not too thin, not too much, not too little. And it takes a long time to master this. Um, the most frustrating, you know, for 25 years I was kind of a uh, uh, Wichita State printmaking studio for 25 years was my home away from home and the most frustrated uh, printmaking students were the, the people who were taking the lithography because they would spend a couple hours grading the stone, several hours drawing the image on the stone, they'd process it, they'd put it up on the, on the press, they'd ink it up and, be, and it wouldn't work. And then they'd have to take the stone all the way back, regrind it down, redraw it, they'd take it back over, process it, ink it up, and it wouldn't work again. Because they were doing something wrong. They were missing a step, or they, they weren't using the right formula. And so the frustration level of lithography can be very high. Um, for this reason, for these two reasons, most lithographs that you will find in museums are not printed by the original, by the artist. They are printed by master lithographers. Uh, not only, not just because of, the, because of the technical skill necessary, but also because lithography is a very specialized printmaking process. You need a special press, which you have here. This is, by the way, Bill Dickerson's original lithographic press at the Art Center. The, the press, I mean, you want to get a lithographic press, you're going to probably cost you $20,000. Uh, Limestones now, especially not being quarried, you can spend thousands of dollars to get a decent limestone. The prints are special, the, 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 the materials are special, the tushes, and, and everything is special. And you're just not going to have that in your studio. And so most artists, when they did lithographs, they were printed by a master lithographer. And here's a couple examples again of, some, of a couple of prairie printmakers. On the left, C.A. Seward. And then a Zanzane. Now these are very simple uh, crayon drawings. And then we have a Lloyd Fultz. I think this is a pretty famous one actually. Um, again, simple crayon drawing. Now the prairie printmakers who did lithographs, they either had their lithographs printed here in Wichita at Wichita Lithographic, or they arranged to have friends of theirs who were capable of printmaking, uh, printing lithographs in, in Chicago or New York or whatever. So they had farmed this, this out. They, they were not printing their lithographs themselves. Here's an ex example of two uh, by a couple students of mine. On the left was a former student, Judy uh, Sullivan. And on the right, uh, Carlene Williams. And you, you can see uh, Judy used a very light touch, very light crayon drawing. Uh, Carlene uh, was more uh, aggressive in the use of her crayon to get you know, really nice darks. Now this is one of mine. Uh, again, it's mostly a crayon drawing, but now I, I added a couple of, of different features that you can do in uh, lithography. On the left is a crayon drawing of the keeper. Now like uh, line etching, getting solid blacks is very difficult to do with, with lithographic crayons and pencils. You have to, it takes a long time. 
And so the way to uh, get really nice solid areas of solid color, we use a, a liquid called tush. It's a high grease content, a kind of a, a darkish gray. And wherever you paint the tush on the stone or the plate, it'll print a nice flat solid black or whatever color you're printing, red, green, whatever it is your color you're printing. So we call this flats. So when a lithographer says, oh, I did a, I, I printed my, my lithograph with 12 flats, that means he or she was, taking, was painting tush on, on their stone and printing them each color using, using tush. So you can see that the nice solid black areas behind the keeper on the left, and then there's the doorway, and there's the hand, and the tunnel. So these are all done uh, using tush. And then I added another process in the upper right hand corner where the hand is, that's a tush wash. Similar to the wash I did on the, the etching plate earlier with, with, that I showed you with lacquer thinner. I dissolved the tush in this case with alcohol and I painted that section in the upper right hand corner and when the alcohol dried it left a very characteristic tush or, or, or texture. Uh, you can do washes, you can do distilled water, you can do mineral spirits, you can do lacquer thinner, you can do turpentine, you can do lighter fluid, and there are a wide range of solvents that you can use to create a wash, and they will all have their own distinct look. So the, the printmaker can pretty much, well, what kind of texture do I want? Okay, I want this kind of texture, I'm going to go get some alcohol, or whatever. Um, I, there's another one, this more recent one on the left. Again, it's a combination of uh, crayon drawing, uh, tush, and of course on the bottom, I did a, a wash on the bottom there. Now the one on the right is an aluminum plate. Now all the ones I've shown you before are stone lithographs. This is an aluminum plate. I don't remember the name of this artist. It, again, it was back uh, at Wichita State when I was a graduate student. Uh, aluminum plates they're obviously a lot cheaper, they're a lot more convenient, you can get them in a lot of large sizes, a lot of, very, a lot of conveniences with using uh, ball-grained aluminum plates. And I've done both, but uh, aluminum plates were more temperamental than, than stones, and uh, if, you, if you made even the tiniest error with an aluminum plate, you're done, you're dead. Uh, if I'm, if I'm working a lithograph on a stone, I've gotten to the point where maybe nine out of ten times, if I, if I have a problem, I can solve it before, it before I end up having to trash the, the litho. But I found with a lumen plate, if something went wrong, it was just, you might just pack it up and forget about it. Um, so I, I haven't done a, a, lumen, a, a aluminum plate in a long, long time. Okay, so now we're getting into color. Uh, you're going to use the same techniques, lithographic crayons, tush washes, you know, everything I've shown you, you're going to use the, the same techniques, but now you're going to print these techniques in colors. Instead of just one color black and white, you're going to print multicolors. Um, and the one on the left, you can see uh, the background color is, is, is in crayon, the solid black of the bowl, because I, I painted it with tush, I print, painted, painted the crayons with, with, with red and yellow, I painted the bowl black, I painted the, uh, the horn, uh, I did a little split roll of gray, or silver and gray. Uh, the thing about lithography, color lithographs, is you're, you have to pretty much print each color separately. So you have to take, a, take your original drawing, create a template with registration marks on it, you put your template on your plate or your stone, you transfer the registration marks onto your stone, and then you trace out the area onto the stone that you're going to print your first color. You also have to transfer your registration marks from your template to your paper. And so in the case on the left, I transferred uh, the background color, I, I transferred uh, the crayon, I drew the crayon, I inked it up, placed my paper on the stone, making sure that the registration all lined up, printed, printed my edition, and then I took the stone over to the grain rack, grained it down, then I had to put the template back onto the stone, trace out my, the area that's going to be my next color, draw it on there, process it, ink it, take it back over to the grain rack, grain it down, put the template back down, draw out my third area, process it, you know. So very, 
time intensive process when you're doing multicolors. Um, the one on the left is really very simple. It's like five color drops. Um, so I was able to do that in just a couple weeks, no big deal. Uh, the one on the left is a little more complicated. Um, I think I had maybe uh, seven or eight color drops on that one. Uh, again, washes, crayon. Uh. The one on the left on this one was part of my Wichita Melodrama series. Now I got about 10 or 11 colors here. So this, this bugger took me quite a while to do. And then I did another one on the right. Again, I think, again, probably about nine or 10 colors. Uh, again, time consuming. Fun, but time consuming. Um, this is an example, I'm gonna show this. This is an example of a poly plate. And I'm gonna get into that to a little bit here a little bit. Uh, a poly plate is a new process. It's uh, basically a, a polyester sheet that you can buy and you can do a lithograph without doing any processing. No gum arabic, no nitric acid or anything of that nature. Uh, what you can do, you can do two things. You can draw directly onto the poly plate with Indian ink or varnishes, permanent markers. I'm going to show you an example of one here shortly. And all you have to do after you've drawn on the poly plate is heat treat it on a, on a hot plate at 150 degrees, which will fuse the image onto the poly plate. You then put it on the press, dampen it, ink it up, and print it. So no processing involved. What I like to use it for is text. I, I do handmade books, and I don't have access to a letter press. So what I do is I'll, I'll set my text on my computer, and I'll print uh, my text from my computer onto the poly plate either using a uh, laser printer or a copy machine. And you can see here, see on the right, uh, I'm doing what the, my, my rainbow or split roll, and I'm, I'm rolling it onto the, onto the, the poly plate. Uh, the poly plate, again, like the solar plate, allows a, uh, a printmaker to, to incorporate digital and photographic images into the studio. And this is an example of, of my handmade book, again, the text on the left, and then I had an image on the right, and I had, I had text around, around the image. Uh, now this print on the right is a stone lithograph, but instead of doing, instead of, but the colors, I went, I went back to, like I always do, the cutout mat board technique. Um, so I got the print there on the right, and here's all the little cutouts. I'm about ready to ink all these up separately and, and, and print them. Um, if I were to do something like that, again, if I were to do something like that using a lithographic process, it's going to take weeks. If I do this using this process, it takes me one day to print the, the stone lithograph and one day to print the color. So two days, I'm done, where rather than two or three weeks. And here's another example, stone lithograph using the cardboard techniques to create my colors. Now, here are two more poly plate lithographs. Uh, the one on the left was a, a, a student of mine who just did a couple weeks ago, and he just drew directly on the poly plate with, with a permanent fine tip permanent marker. We heat treated it, put it on the press and ink, and printed it up and printed a half a dozen. It was just that simple. The one on the left is by a photographer, uh, Mark Fuller, and he took a photograph and had it on his computer, and he color separated it into three, yellow, red, and blue, and he printed, so he printed out three poly plates, one for yellow, one for red, one for blue, and he brought them into the studio, and we just printed them off to create a multicolor uh, poly plate lithograph. And I, you may not recognize it, but that person is Andy Warhol. Here's another poly plate where I, I took some digital images on my computer and printed, uh, printed it off on the poly plate, printed in black, and then colored, and then went to uh, watercolors for my colors. Very fast, very simple technique. So I'm going to finish this off with, with uh, since the, really the, the object of this, process, of this presentation is to show you the various ways that you can make prints, I thought it would be appropriate to show two examples of, of, of a local well-known artist, Kathleen Shanahan. And the reason is because Kathleen uses every possible printmaking pro technique and, and trick that she can find. Uh, she will, she does a, she 
creates this Im her images using a, a kind of a collage approach, and she'll have a dry point plate, she'll do a collagraph plate, she'll do a polyplate lithograph, she'll do a, um, relief techniques, mono printing. I mean, just any printmaking process, she does it. And she incorporates it all to create her final image. And here's, here's another example here. And, uh, and so you've got this, this vibrant combination of colors and textures and techniques and processes. And then, of course, after she's done, then, of course, being, a paint, being an ex excellent draftsperson and an excellent painter, she then finishes off by drawing and painting into it. So, so, so Kathleen just uses everything that she can. And they're just, they're just wonderful pieces, and, and they really show beautifully just what you can do with the process of printmaking if you choose to do it. And that is it. OK. Um, Mr. Billings is not able to see the Zoom, so if, if any of the participants have a question, you need to actually type it into the chat. Um, so while we're waiting for some of you to type some of those things, um, I have a question. Um, what's the difference between a printmaker who makes prints, or maybe I'm answering this question for you, and, and, and a well-known artist that has prints, or is there a difference? Well, the only, the only difference is a printmaker prints his own, his own prints. Uh, many artists uh, will just, they'll create the image, but they'll have somebody else do all the technical uh, work involved in actually printing it. It's still their image. It's still their artwork. But they had somebody else actually produce it. And this is a tradition that goes back centuries. Uh, you can go to the Renaissance where you had uh, painting studios where the master painter, Da Vinci or whatever, would have apprentices work on his canvases, do a lot of the canvas, maybe, maybe the backgrounds and, and other areas, and then he'd come in and finish them off. They're still his, his paintings. You know, so, so this is not unusual for artists to do this. Okay. Any any questions from the audience? Okay, this is Patricia chiming in with a question. Um, can you help us understand the distinction between a monoprint and some of the processes that you shared and showed where there's a lot of hand coloring? Um, and yet it seems as though um, if you are, if there's handwork in each impression, mm -hmm. that's a monoprint. Is there a distinction well, or, or is that just let, let, a vocabulary I'll, problem? Or yeah. <laughs> what's, well, what's a monoprint and what, what are, is some of the um, hand coloring that you right. were talking about? Well, I would, I would my standard definition of a monoprint, and I'd like to, this, to define it by comparing it to what people call a monotype. Okay. A monotype is where you create the Im you, you create an image again. You could take like a piece of plexiglass, and you you paint or draw or whatever you're doing on the plexiglass, and you do everything in one stage. You know all your colors, all your textures. I mean, basically, it's like painting on canvas. It's it's all done, and then you then you put a piece of paper on it and you run it through the press one time. And that's it. You're done. To me, that, that's a monotype. A monoprint is where you might take the same plexiglass and you'll, do, you'll print the image in sections. You'll, 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 you'll put some yellow ink on the plexiglass plate. You'll print it. Then you'll take the plexiglass and you'll, you'll put some red on the plexiglass and you'll print the red on top of the yellow. Then you'll take some blue and you'll print some blue. So a monoprint is going through the press multiple times. You're, you're building up the image in stages. Color drop, color drop, color drop, color drop. Monotype, one shot through the press, that's it, you're done. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the other processes, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the cutout uh, mat boards and everything, that's the, you, you just call that a relief process. Well, of course, monoprinting and monoprint is a relief process because you're, you're printing off the surface of the plexiglass or copper or whatever it is you're using. So it's a relief process. 
you just it's just a different way of approaching a relief uh, print um, okay and not surprisingly uh, mono, mono types are very popular with painters because basically you're not changing anything you, all you're doing is instead of painting on a canvas you're painting on plexiglass printmakers prefer mono printing because that involves a little more interesting processes and 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 so we, we like the mono printing uh, uh, process better than the monotype. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Um, then I presume that this session is probably over. Um, we thank Mr. Billings for um, giving us his time today to talk about these many processes and and um, and with the details and everything and showing some of his own works plus others work um, and so um, this session has been recorded and probably in a week's time uh, for those that weren't able to log on and watch it live on zoom um, it should appear on the art museums possibly their youtube um, um, channel and so it'll be recorded for posterity so thank you everyone you may leave the meeting